All righty. It looks like we are back in live today, everyone. Um, Ken, Ken, Dr. Barr, uh, thank you all so much for joining me today. How are y'all doing today? Great to be here. It's Friday and we got cats and what else do we need, right? <laughs> That's exactly. Right. Bundle here. <laughs> Perfect. Well, let's see. We're giving folks just a little bit of time to, to join on in now, just from Zoom and Facebook as well. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of an, of an introduction for you all, but you know, I know what people always, always do want to hear about, of course, is the background as well. So, you know, Dr. Ken, before I, I do that big introduction, I kind of want you to, to introduce the true star of the show with, with Bug and Bug's gym on there. Excuse me just a minute. <laughs> I'm going to try and, try and get her. Can you guys see her up there? Of course. There we go. That's the star of the show. <laughs> good, good. Well, uh, you know, folks, we have some two very, very, very fantastic guests today. Uh, you know, one thing we do want to start out, of course, is this is a general education webinar about cats. Um, this information is not for you to make any decisions about the clinical ma management of a cat um, with these diseases or with these conditions. If you have any specific questions about case management, um, or things that you want changed or prescribed, um, please, you know, talk to the treating, your treating local veterinarian for the best care for your cat. Uh, but that being said, my name is Dr. Chris Mendes. I'm the Chief Veterinary Officer from Base Paws, and here today we've got Dr. Ken Lambert um, and Dr. Bob Haydall. Now, Dr. Lambert is the founding owner and medical director of the West Town Veterinary Clinic. He graduated from the University of Missouri in 1981 and then has been in clinical practice for 32 years. Um, his practice interests are feline preventative medicine, preventative and therapeutic nutrition, and supplements and advanced dental procedure. He's got four cats, um, and Bug is the clinic's namesake, Bug Ventures, often comes to the clinic, which you have already seen, and she has her own Facebook page. Now, Dr. Barthel, um, he received his bachelor's from animal science from California Polytechnical State University and his DVM from Colorado State in 2014. Um, he's been gaining practical experience in the small animal clinic and large animal mobile, um, as well as operating his own small animal mobile. And at this time, he really has explored and been really interested in new technologies. That's part of why you know, we're, we're here today to talk about telemedicine as well. Um, and he's currently working on his um, epidemiology PhD at the University of Guelph, um, and of course, continuing to apply his interest of technology into the veterinary world itself. So, um, again, thank you all. Thank you all so much for being here today. And introduce this, if I would like to say, it's a really interesting concept, getting all of this technology. How do we use this technology to improve our cats' lives from a, a veterinary and then also from a remote standpoint? So I, I guess I would start out by saying what, what happened to me along the way was I got so interested in cats in the clinic side and I kept seeing virtually 50, 60% of them overweight. I would hear the frustrations of the clients. Uh, I don't know what to feed. I don't know how to feed. One, one of my cats is stealing the other cat's food. So, I mean, I heard enough that I started a, we started a contest called Pets Reducing for Rescues. It's running right now. It's got a week to go. But basically what we did was we, we would get the vendors of pet food companies involved uh, then it kind of transitioned to technology pieces, feeders, uh, webcams, uh, scales, all those sorts of things. And so now we're able to actually uh, solve those problems in the home better because really what, what Bugs Gym now has become besides a, a socialization center and that sort of thing, we now are testing devices and feeding cats. We'll talk a little bit about that more, but basically it was just being a frustrated veterinarian that I couldn't solve my client's problems and we turned to technology. And then I met Barr, and uh, he's kind of solving those technology problems for us. Well, Barr, you've got some some kind of interesting rates. Of, what are what are the kind of the rates of obesity are looking like now in the general um, kind of veterinary world for cats? Yeah. So um, surprisingly, the, the estimated rates of, of overweight and obese cats in the U.S. is around sixty percent. Wow. And so yeah, and, and of those sixty percent. Um, over half of them are obese. They're not just, you know, a little bit overweight, but grossly overweight, right? And so, um, and so pretty large problem, right? Pun, pun intended. So, um, 
And I think it's, uh, Chris, it's interesting to see, I think they put out on um, the Pet, Pet Obesity Prevention Association, right, that about one, uh, an excess one excess pound in a, in a cat is equivalent to about 15 excess pounds in, a, in an adult a female, about 17 pounds in an adult male human, right? So pretty significant um, changes there. Um, yeah, and so we all know, right, cats, you know, fat cats are cute, right? But, but what isn't cute is, is all the chronic conditions that come um, associated with those, right? As we know, diabetes, orthopedic issues, uh, kidney dysfunction, you know, respiratory disorders, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, you know, normal weight cats live longer, healthier, happier lives. And, and so our aim was to see how we can leverage technology as a tool in a weight, you know, weight loss and weight management program. Well, you know, and as you mentioned, this, this problem is at 60% of, of overweight standpoint. But, you know, we, Dr. Ken, you mentioned you've been seeing these challenges for people for, for kind of years um, in, your, in your clients. Um, kind of how would you compare those challenges to, you know, feeding a dog versus feeding a cat? Why are, why are you hearing more on that step and that side? Yeah, that's a that's a great um, a great question, Chris. So really, veterinarians we were scared to diet cats, and and many still are. Mm -hmm. And I I take it with a you know I mean I'm very very uh, safety conscious. But what I found is if we didn't do something, we didn't try something different. Um, so when in 2014, we really as veterinary professionals got our first guidelines. So the AHA, American Animal Hospital Association, put together the obesity guidelines. Some colleagues and friends of mine, Julie Churchill, Dr. Ernie Ward was on that. Tap, this is like some of the greats in pet obesity. So then it allowed us as practitioners to know. But one of the key things is protein. We literally have to have two grams per kilogram of protein for ideal weight, period. Otherwise, fatty liver, uh, you know, a cat could go into a crisis and, and not recover or have to have a feeding tube for weeks or months. Nobody wants that. So what we had to do is really look at careful weight loss. Well, the challenge is too, here's a 10 pound animal. You cannot put that cat in your arms, jump on your scale and get an accurate weight. We need something to 0.02 pounds, which is like 0.3, 4.2 ounces. Yeah, thank you. 0.3 ounces. So we can't, we don't have the technology yet, but now baby scales are $35 on Amazon and we do have the technology. Now that doesn't say it's going to be easy to get the cat on the scale, does it? It's up for you guys off to my side. I just had one of our Bugs Gym Foster Rescues jump on the scale and just sit there. Now they don't all do that, right? So, but there's a, what I'm saying is there's a lot of tricks. Mm -hmm. we, then we need those weights for those cats that are at home. And that's where I, I wanna, we're, I know we're gonna talk about telehealth. Unless the veterinarian has that data, we can't make a recommendation of increase or decrease. We mm -hmm. can't examine a cat. Once we examine a cat, we can get a body condition score. Then we can safely do that. So I love what you said. This is not something you just can randomly do at home. This takes a, a tuned in professional, some good equipment, and then if, if it's the average household, which is 2.1 cats, okay, um, we have the average household in the U.S. is a multi-cat household. Well, that means they may not share well or steal, steal or share, you can do it whichever way you want. But that's where we're using a, one of the brand new feeders. Uh, it's made by Sure Pet Care. Unbelievable product that will tell you how much food to put in there, when the cats eat, uh, how much it ate, and and put it all on an app. So this this is technology that I'm sure will blow people away. It's a brand new product. I think it's been in the U.S. for six months. We've been using their different types of feeders and others for over five years. They've they've really worked hard, and they they owe uh, I think at least a look see and our support because they're they're doing it. They're nailing it. Oh, well, that's great to hear. You know, there's so much exciting. Uh, possibilities with technology and kind of helping extend extend those kind of accurate representations or accurate that we get in the clinic, you know, back into the home so that we can kind of have that better better home management of those cats as well and not have them have to come back and forth and back and forth and back and forth to a clinic all the time. Now, you know, with with all these tech tools, I know Bar Dr. Barr, you've been you've been you, know, you and Ken have been using those in some of your research. Is that right? Yeah, and so we just uh, um, kind of in an analysis stage of a research project where we took a, 
a bunch of devices and made it like a home techno pet technology ecosystem. Mm -hmm. and, we tried to, and we gave it to, you know, we had a, a bunch of overweight cats that, that were part of a weight management program or a weight loss program. And we get half of them, the tech, dev you know, the tech devices and half of them in more of a traditional weight loss program, right? And we want to see a, how, how weight loss uh, rates would compare between the two. And then also kind of satisfaction with these devices. How do people like it? You know, what worked well with the, with the pet parents, what worked well with the pets, et cetera. And so kind of initial results show that we actually got about four times the weight loss uh, rate in, in the group that had the technology and an overall higher satisfaction in terms of using those devices and in terms of the owners feeling empowered with the, with the weight loss program or more empowered with the weight loss program. Mm -hmm. um, and some kind of, you know, and, and I guess the, the owners or pet parents mainly like to have, you know, one of the things was a, a scale here, right? Just a basic baby scale. Um, we, we didn't have a smart one uh, uh, we were trying to that, that fell through, but we just had a basic baby scale they put on it and, and what they, you know, satisfaction for that was the highest actually in terms of being a valuable addition to a weight management program. And they liked the accuracy and they liked the, you know, more co continuous monitoring, at least for the veterinarians, for us, right? As we make that, that shift from that more episodic monitoring to that continuous monitoring, right? So they don't have to come into the clinic. We only get a weight every six months to a year. Now we're getting those weights twice a week, every week, right? Mm -hmm. Put in a diary, we would have that information online and we could help monitor that uh, more consistently. So that was one of the most, you know, um, valuable, valuable additions. And then the other top one that people liked was, was the feeder. This is what, you know, Dr. Ken kind of mentioned. It was, uh, well, the one we used in this one was a SureFeed um, Pet Connect. And, and what the, the main component was, A, was uh, patient control. So they could only, only the correct cat could uh, come in here based on their microchip and only open for that cat, right? If another cat came, it would close, when, you know, wouldn't let them eat. And then it had a, had a gram scale in it with a really easy light indicator here with these dots. And so it was a really, really easy way to have accurate measurements for, for owners to, um, uh, for their portion control of the food, right? And, and uh, there's been studies out there that show, you know, like when we have those cup measurements, just a, you know, little variation in where you fill that cup and we're gonna get a huge amount, uh, a difference of food, right? And that can lead to weight gain, um, you know, over a long period of time, so. Well, absolutely. And, you know, and, and, you know, you fill a cup to a brim or just a little over brim, suddenly you're 10% above, suddenly you're 10%. Exactly, right? And I think, I think you guys mentioned this before in your previous ones that like 10 cable a day can eat equal to a pound a year, right? So, I mean, it's like, it, it seems minimal, but over time it can make a huge difference, especially when you're talking about a little 10 pound cat, right? And, and so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you know, with, have you had any issues with, particularly with that, that sure pet feeder of a, we'll say, I know you mentioned it only opens for one cat, but kind of a, an ambushing, an ambushing, a, a, a side party from there. Yeah, I think, and I think Ken can comment on as well. I mean, he's probably thinking the same thing. You can get that. And we've actually noticed, cause we also had a, a, um, you know, one of these webcams pointed at the feeders, right? And so this is a, a treat dispenser webcam. They have a couple, couple out there, right? This is one of them that we use pet cube. Um, and so we caught some of those behaviors and, 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 it, and it was funny because sometimes we even noticed um, that some of those cats, if you have a, a situation with a dominant cat stealing food from the um, less dominant cat, uh, they got pretty smart. So they knew that the, you know, the other cat's feeder would only open when they're there. So they would actually drag them over and they would have them, you know, uh, open it while they're there. So, you know, we have to adapt the technology as, as our cats are outsmarting it, right? And so um i think down the line of course those things get fixed and, and then we see less of those issues so. yeah we were we were chatting a little bit before we went live about uh we all love technology as long as it works okay. <laughs> and yeah. i think this is really the case where you not it, you these feeders with there's lots of them on the market i have clients using them all the time and they say dr ken why would i use this one or that one i said you know accuracy uh, these six times. So, so let's get back to cat behaviors because we did say we we're going to follow the cat's rule book, right? Six to eight times a day, small yeah. frequent feedings. And we could talk about dry and can till the cows come home, but they're, this, this feeder will feed can. So yeah. that, that's great. Um, but, but really then, so feeding stations too. Each cat should have their own station at least two feet away from any other feeding station, sleeping station, or litter box. Now, most we've got a very savvy audience they probably all know that but you know what if you miss that then you're going to have inner cat aggression 
you're going to have all kinds of problems. So the webcam, actually, it was kind of a peripheral part, as was the activity monitor. But we found in our pilot study, it showed us there was a, a, a malfunction. Um, these, these webcams are amazing. Um, so at any rate, I think, I think there, yeah, let's make sure the technology is set up correctly. So we, when we set up a system in a home, we use that to our viewing. Now, obviously you have to make it public, private, all that sharing stuff, because it is a webcam, right? But again, the, the beauty of being people, when we used to be able to travel, right? Being able to check in on their pets, throw them a treat, say hi, the speaker quality, all these, again, it's technology that I think every pet owner should should consider because it's that bond you're at work you're bored you get to I, i'll check in all of my cats stay in at bugs gym while i'm at a on the road and i'll check in and throw them a treat and see that they're healthy and happy and i tell you i have a much better night's sleep so. well you know and you you mentioned also with kind of the feeding stations and the, the feeding six to eight times a day rather than kind of you know, we've, we've also talked a lot in kind of some previous ones about hunting and like hunting for feeding, you know, how, how do you like to kind of achieve that need for cats um, to, to get a little bit you of know, that? That's, that's a tough one. And I, I'm good friends with Liz Bales and I love her little hunter model that she's got. But the issue is with multiple cats. How do they distribute that equally? Now, I'm sure that you, you can do that, but it's a little tricky. So we haven't, we haven't gone there with that type of product, but we've actually found the automatic feeders that open, the cats will use it. They'll come flying across the room when they hear that. And that's uh, the Portion Pro we used for a while. And it was amazing. It was it stimulated. And if you think about it, the pet cube, when you throw a, a, a treat, if we could, and I've talked to the company about this, it could calibrate that it's throwing you right around and you could throw it 10, 20 times a day, that again, we have a multiple cat problem, which, which, cat, which cat gets the food. But you can see, so I don't think the perfect device has been developed yet, but it would be robotic, sense the correct cat, let the cat chase it and spit out the appropriate calories and then, and then close up, right? So it really, it, it's an inventor's playground or nightmare, I guess, depending on how you look at it. We really strive to use the best products that are gonna give the best outcomes in a safe way. Um, but to, to the cat, we call them cat arounds. So I, I do have one of these in my house for my diabetic cat that needs to eat a special food. And I don't want my other cats eating a food that's over 500 calories per cup. And so mm -hmm. they make a plastic bubble that goes on the back of it. And Bug will wait. Bug is actually in the program because she's overweight. She's a fierce hunter and she'll wait till my diabetic eats and she'll dive in at the last, grab a couple bites before the thing closes. <laughs> You can adjust the you can adjust the feeders and closing rates and all that good stuff. So. Oh, that's yeah, and then, you know you mentioned an inventor's nightmare or playground on there. I'm pretty sure you know for that that mobile ha uh, hunting feeder you just described four breakthroughs in in a variety of, of identification or something like on there. I mean, we've got one that cleans our floors. Like, why not just you yeah. know put a feeder on top of that and let's go. <laughs> Well, and, and I think, Ken, I remember we were reading those articles and they have ones coming out where they can, it's all artificial intelligence based and they can, they see where your cat is. You say, I don't want him on my couch. I don't want him here. Doesn't let it go there. And then it shoots out lasers, knowing where your cat is to, to you know, um, to kind of promote those hunting behaviors. So those are, those are great. And even these webcams are starting to now understand what behaviors look like and they can key in uh, to owners and send you updates or they're working on it to get those algorithms. To explain to you, you know, your cat's been sleeping a little bit more, it's not moving as much, it doesn't jump as high. So you're starting to get those kind of behaviors, um, yeah, understood by these things through artificial intelligence. So I think down the road, it's only going to get more and more interesting. Well, and you mentioned kind of the tracking thing. I know you all use some, some activity monitors as well. Were there any that you felt were kind of um, or better or kind of higher? How did, you, how did you find your experience with those? Yeah, in our pilot study, I'll let Barr talk to the results. It's a little tricky. Accelerometers are, are, are pretty, uh, pretty challenging little creatures, but Fitbark and Babblebark both have nice, small, cat-friendly, and that mm. was the key. Can't have a big bulky dog uh, mm -hmm. monitor on. But the thing that we really found and love about these monitors is they also come with a diary. So if you talk about telehealth and we have a Babel Park challenge and we have cats and dogs wearing these, these monitors, it's wonderful when the client can just ping us, the weight comes right into our system. I've got a dashboard. I can put that into our, 
you know, if, if they're a contestant, I know what's going on, but it's a, and the, so that diary, now we always need to back up the diary, okay, because it's electronics. We had a little preview talk about a cat that scared me this morning. Redundancy, redundancy, redundancy. Uh, feeders don't always work perfect. Um, you know, the webcam watches that and the diary keeps us all because we do not want these cats losing too fast. So back to the sobering part of it. But no, it's amazing. A diary, that interaction between the client, uh, Babble Bark for one, there's a couple of them out there, but Babble Bark has a great nutritional diary where you can go in and find out how many calories and how many, how many calories in the treats that you're feeding. So that's vital. Um, Again, these cats that are 20% overweight are always, always, always on a prescription food. We have to know the protein quality. We have to know the micronutrients are in there. Some of these cats are going to take six to 12 months to diet. You cannot just go grab a bag of food off the counter and, and hope that it will, will cover them. This is an area we also have to be very, very uh, cognizant of. Yeah, and I'll just add us a couple, just a couple points people can see. So these are like a couple examples of the monitors, right? One, they're, they're size of quarters to um, a little bit bigger than that, you know, and some of them, I guess, are more widely used in dogs, obviously. Um, we get a little better, better weight loss results with, um, with uh, increasing activity in dogs, but still useful for the cats too, right? And we were able to um, give owners kind of an objective measurement to, um, uh, for activity. And so they were able to be, okay, this is your cat's normal baseline activity level. Can we increase a little bit by looking at the activity and, and, and hopefully, you know, um, the owners at, at kind of a benchmark or a target in terms of activity. Let's increase those activity counts by 20% this week and hopefully that'll you know, lead to some, some increased results in terms of weight loss. I gotta, gotta tell a funny, funny anecdote. I mean, I, we, Duncan LaSalle runs when he sees me coming because I've got another dumb accelerometer question, right? <laughs> so he's been a great resource, but he, it really, he said, Ken, there's so much data coming from these accelerometers that it's gonna be really hard to correlate with activity. And we know there's some great products coming. We've seen, again, back when we could go to live lectures, but Zoetis is coming out with a fantastic product and we know it's been tested with accelerometers, but think about pain management, activity after weight, uh, activity period that they're, that, you know, they're or sleeping in the wrong area. I mean, again, I think as Dr. Barr says, is that the, uh, the artificial intelligence factor and, you know, getting, knowing what's going on, because how many, okay, so cats sleep 21 hours out of 24. You guys know that. That was proven by Actical, which was the first monitor of this kind that was ever validated. Some of these are not validated yet. Okay. So, but they're, they're in a lot of institutions. We had discussion with another one that's coming out and they're, they're in, they want to be in vet schools. They're detecting seizures. They're te who knows, but, but so ours, it was kind of a, 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 a diary and, an, and it, this will be interesting, but we, it wasn't truly part of the study yet, but we really wanted to get familiar with the kind of data, the amount of data, how are we, how can we share that data? And again, all this to, to get obesity, move the needle on pet obesity. Mm, absolutely. And, you know, when you talk about moving the needle on pet obesity, and one of the, the great things that, that you do in, at Brewbug's Cat Gym as well is, is the pets producing for rescues on there. You know, of course, we have a lot of, a lot of pets, dogs and cats um, do come into to rescues and fosters in a, in a very overweight situation, in a very overweight situation and, and helping them uh, reduce down and get into a healthy weight for when they, they go from there. I'm, I know you shared this with me a little earlier. Uh, Dr. Ken and I'm going to have you kind of speak a little bit to this as well, but um, you know, this is, I'm just going to let you go. This is really a fantastic initiative. Yeah. So this has uh, candidly been one of the most challenging and rewarding things I've ever done. Um, when I got into weight management years ago, I had a 12,000 square foot facility. I had swim in place pool for dogs, whatever. The first contest had four dogs in it. We didn't do cats until I wasn't brave enough to do cats till I had the data to show me that it was safe. And Deb Zoran gets credit for that. She gave a lecture. I was sitting there with a couple of associates and she said, just keep the protein above 40% and go slow and you should be fine. No. And we looked at each other like, do we really trust that? The first cat I did was 18 pounds down to 10. The cat is still living out in Colorado. You know, it's, it's, that's the rewarding part. The tough part is convincing people to do this. Okay. So we, built the contest to incent, kind of make it a game, 
we're, we're, we're give prizes and just mm -hmm. motivate people. The really great thing, we've been working with three of, of Madison's wonderful rescues. Uh, Underdog does both cats and dogs. Uh, Dane County Humane Society does cats and dogs. And Madison Cat Project is just cats. These rescues come to Cats Night Out. We now have a dog gym. Bug has a dog gym downstairs. So we have <laughs> events down there back when we can, when COVID loosens its grip just a little bit. But what we've had to do this year, Chris, is take everything virtual. And mm -hmm. so that's been a real pivot. The real coincidental thing was our gold sponsor this year is Babble Bark. And they said, hey, we want to we want to do something with telehealth and weight management. I think it was a week before the contest was going to uh, start. And if Bruce Truman is on the, on the line, he can, and I'm driving and talking into trying to get something and, and it worked, it worked really well, except we didn't get a lot of dogs. So we are going to do a challenge, a fitness challenge after the contest. What's mm -hmm. the point? Again, data, getting the client engaged, using the diary, a nice slick, it's just you should really really take a peek at that mm -hmm. those those dogs won't all need feeders that's more of a cat product but every one of these products has been previous sponsors and many of them have been sponsors year after year because we love their products they work toletta is the litter box uh we didn't talk about that but believe it or not there is a facial recognition litter box for cats out with a built-in scale a little fancier than what Dr. Hader showed you there before. A little more expensive too. But if you want to know which of your four cats uh, urinated, defecated, and how much any of that weighed, mm -hmm. these guys are amazing. Just just came to North America. We have ten of them in Bugs Gym and out on loan, and uh, just an incredible product. We we talked a lot about the Sure Pet Care, the Pet mm -hmm. Cube. We love. It's an add-on, but it's a really nice thing. And then. Purina is the, is the food that we use in Bugs Gym because it's very high protein. It's very low calorie. Their new cat product is below 300 calories. And 300 calories is pretty hard to do at 50% protein. I have a little calculator I send home with my clients. And if you find a food that's above 50% protein and below 300 calories, tell me about it. In five years, I've not had a single client come back with that food. That's yeah. a magic bullet as far as cat weight loss from, from my perspective. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so it, I, that's the contest gets me all excited. So <laughs> it's a week to go. My staff is downstairs getting ready. We've had to turn all the weigh-ins weigh into virtual, but we're going beyond that. We've realized that this works so well with the technology we now have that mm -hmm. really we want the veterinarian to be in control of the conversation. We want this to be safe and we want them to have tools that work. So. Dr. Hader and I are, are dedicated that to that through Pets Reducing for Rescues. Well, you know, and that's, that's such a, a fantastic thing, you know, using it, and I mentioned it earlier, but increasing, increasing the tools for kind of, for kind of telehealth and, and teleadvice for veterinarians and really extending, extending our reach um, to be able to stay in the home with, with those cats a little more is, is such a huge thing to do. Um, I know when we're going to talk a little bit more about about the contest, but you know, when we start to look at these products, you know, with Dr. Barr, how do you start to see these products working with a telehealth scenario? Yeah, and so that's a great question. So, you know, combining telehealth and these remote monitoring training systems is one of our primary focuses in our in our PhD lab here. So, um, and I guess I guess to start off, uh, just to kind of uh, you know, people use telehealth and telemedicine interchangeably sometimes, and so just to kind of clarify that there are some subtle differences there. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, depending who you ask, you know, may change slightly. But but in general, and according to the AVMA kind of definition, so telehealth is kind of that overall umbrella that encompasses all use of technologies and uh, digital communications for delivery of health, health information. And then that can be broken down into subcategories depending on who's communicating and what information is being transferred, right? So, and then we have the telemedicine, which is that subset, um, and that's kind of referring to using those telecommunication tools to, to deliver uh, medical information and clinical services remotely. And so when we combine telemedicine, when we have that, that, that clinical services and we're able to combine telemonitoring, which is another you know, subset, right? And we have that kind of continuous passive monitoring through these devices, we're able to, to A, really empower the veterinarian to kind of have that continuous monitoring throughout and so that more episodic like we were talking about, and then shifting that medical landscape into that more... Um, 
preventative, uh, proactive approach versus this kind of uh, reactive approach, right? Once they come in, they're already sick, we got to deal with it. But now we kind of get a handle of it earlier and, and kind of sooner. And so we kind of have that continuous uh, health monitoring, continuous treatment and continuous advice as well. And that's, I mean, that, that is kind of exactly what we need. You know, Dr. Dr. Ken, we, we talked a little bit, you talked a little bit about the prizes and things that we can that you use to kind of incentivize that to help that weight loss with a, with the points, the pop point system itself as well. But you know that, you know how did how did COVID throw a little bit of a bug and, and change everything for you? Oh man, yeah, we, we had this elaborate system that we set up a couple of years back, and so what we found, Chris, is we just didn't want to just reward people that that were successful in the weight management program. Some of these, honestly, some of these pets gain weight. It was very hard to get them back in to use a scale, but to have really a fair contest, we wanted to use the same scale. I think we've kind of given up on that for good. We did put our dog scale outside in front of the clinic. Uh, it's a very nice scale. It's not as nice as the new one that automatically puts the weights right into the practice management software. So we really like that. Uh, it's a very stable scale. And uh, that's a, a, a discussion all in itself. The dogs have to feel comfortable. You know, the scales go up and down. This new one takes a five second algorithm and gives you an exact number. So at any rate, it's a veterinarian's dream come true type of thing, because again, the dogs wiggle, whatever. For cats, we could easily loan out these scales. And I think uh, Dr. Bars and I, we've both been impressed how, how very accurate they are. We have five of them, I think. And I go from room to room and we check them all the time and they're spot on. Uh, between each other. And so that, again, so, so we've, we've had to make a scale available. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had to be able to have them text, email, uh, which are all, right, all forms of telehealth, really, text, email, and uh, call. Some people still call in. We get messages on Facebook, hey, they've lost two pounds, and we, you know, we have to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's too fast. Or, you know, so, <laughs> so again, that, that monitoring, that back and forth, the veterinarian needs to know. So the PAW was developed, that not just the ones that lose weight, but did they partner? Did they find a neighbor? Did they form a pack or a pride, again, to make it fun? Did they want to buy a a pet pet care, um, sure pet care feeder. Well, we give them points for that. We just had a client who's been in the contest three or four times. She she sent us a receipt that she donated seventy five dollars to local rescue. She gets seven points. She's okay. jonesing for the Toletta. I know exactly what's going on here. So she's been to she's been to the and the Babble Bark folks came and we we had our cats night out, which was a kickoff for the cats, and we had one for dogs. But they were here. That was pre COVID. So I really miss that one on one sharing. But what we're going to do is take the finale virtual. We're going to do it five days after. So if anybody wants a flavor for the stories, how excited people get, and the successes that are all unique, they've done things that I never thought of. So it's just a, really, it's a community, Chris, of solving the problem together. And that's just the people that are dedicated to this. And then they go tell their neighbors. They've told me, I, I I can't help it, Dr. Ken. I've heard this from staff too. I, I wanted to touch that dog so I could see what the body conditions are. I said, sorry, I gave, I gave you the virus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, you know, it is so exciting once we really start to see, see those progresses being made. And, you know, I, I know you're not being able to see them in, as in person with, with the kind of the, with the client contestants at this point in time, but Y'all did share you are still doing some kind of foster rescue um, contest going on right now as well. Yeah. So new this year, we asked each one of the rescues in plenty of time to find two overweight cats to live in Bugs Gym during the contest. Um, actually, Dane County Humane Society couldn't find, we couldn't find another one. So Bug is going to volunteer to be in that group because she's lost. She gained a little bit. So she's in that group. So each of these rescues. So what we're going to do is have a a six-way competition, and then we're going to have a combination. The grand, whichever rescue pairs up, uh, they get a $500 donation out of the, the pool, the sponsorship pool. The money comes from the sponsors, uh, the products, we make some money there, people donate, you know, it's, a, it's kind of move, money moving everywhere, but we, all proceeds from anything that we sell go to the rescues. Um, and we've developed now a website that this can go on year round. So we're pretty excited about that because these cats, if they go home without technology, uh, Chris, they're, they're going to gain that weight back. 
Yeah. We really need that monitoring. So we'll have a subscription service that will kind of start with these guys. We've got some cats that were in our research project that are going to be on that subscription and that they'll all able to have telehealth consults. They'll be able to get the weights to us. They'll be able to ask questions. So we're still rolling that out. But if there's anybody that's interested, you know, that stay tuned. That's in a matter of months. So. Well, and, you know, one of the things that, that y'all shared, um, and, you know, I'll, what I love to, to kind of see this when we start to think about diaries and the numbers, you know, Dr. Barr, you mentioned earlier kind of the episodic versus the continually continual monitoring kind of that switch into there. And mm -hmm. this is this is kind of the current the current graph that you all shared with me about where the five um, uh, rescue cats are that are in this contest right now. And so uh, I, this this it, to me is kind of you know a, a veterinarian's weight weight management dream um, from this standpoint as these these days are just separated separated apart from there and uh, they they're showing such great progress you know uh, even though it's not a ton of time you know I, I'll kind of let you speak to to how fast you know what what should we look like when we start to look for cats to lose weight. Bar, do you want to lead yeah. off? You put you put in more. Oh, work. yeah. So I guess here in this graph, we're just kind of showing yeah that the kind of progress the trend the trend line right, which is huge for. Mm -hmm. uh, for anybody, for the vets, for the owners, just to kind of be able to monitor that progress. And if we can get that in a, on a more consistent basis, we can make changes quicker to the food, how much we're feeding, um, activity, et cetera. And then especially in cats, when it's very important, uh, more so than dogs, that we stay within a certain range, right? And that's usually around 1% or 2% uh, weight loss uh, per week, average weight loss per week. Once you go a little bit higher than that, it starts to get really dangerous and we can get into some liver issues and they can, um, which can be fatal. And so that's what's really extra important with these cats and why we have these, uh, these graphs is to show us. You have another graph that actually graphs the percentage, average percentage weight loss that we've had in the previous week. So we know if we're getting too high, okay, let's start, you know, adding some more calories, change the diet, um, are we getting too low? And then, you know, um, maybe we have to decrease some of that caloric intake. And so we can adjust accordingly a lot quicker so we get a little bit uh, more immediate results. Perfect. Yeah, yeah we, oh, I'll let you go, Dr. Well, yeah. we, we just found that, yeah, we really needed twice a week weights. And it's hard. People get busy. And so really my staff, because Bugs Gym is essentially a home environment, they come up every day, or, you know, but they're, they're weighing just as it would be in a home situation. They have problems with the feeder though. They come to me. Uh, we still are up here checking these cats, making sure, but it, it's again, it's these are very high risk cats. I think they're, they were all nine. Well, there was one that was maybe an eight, but most of them were nine out of nine. Uh, and that's a body condition. We talked briefly about that. For each body condition score point over five, which is ideal, six for 10 year old cats and up, uh, basically 10 to 15% overweight. Well, you take like Diego, who was a, a cat that was 24 pounds, is now down to 14. Hmm. That's he was more than 40 percent, more than the, so the body condition score breaks down a little bit over nine. So, mm -hmm. but we still need that ideal weight because that's where we calculate the calories. So that's where yes, the body condition score. Thanks, it's a perfect slide. You have to be able to touch the cat to really make this work. My staff gets really good at it after say a month or so. And we actually play a game, three of us all have to agree. I'm usually a half a point to a point stricter. And I say, <laughs> we wanna be strict because the, we wanna get the cat to lose. If we do it too high, and again, we're still gonna monitor how much do they lose per week. And again, the gold standard within the, the Board of Nutritionists is about 1% a week. You can go faster, but it's again, much safer at one, and we don't typically do that. So, and you know the 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 disease, of course, they're talking about. You know, folks may have heard about is hepatic lipidosis as well, and that's that's kind of where we get cats get too much fat into their liver, um, and starts to cause some very very some very dangerous issues on there. Now, um, we do have a lot of questions rolling in, folks. If you do have ever, any more questions, put them in your Zoom chat, put them in your Facebook chat, and we'll get to them. And I know we've got a couple more things to cover, but we'll also I'd like to get a couple questions, you know, kind of sorted out and looked at from from a standpoint, you know, uh, and this one is is really, you know, an interesting question that that always kind of comes through around multi cat households. You know, what what's kind of the best way to to manage that? You know, the question that we do have is, 
is around spray bottles. You know, is a spray bottle an appropriate way to try to stop a bully cat from from doing it, or is it, or where should we be going? With our thoughts. Yeah, I'll I'll speak to that. Cats should, and I rarely use this word, never be punished. Mm -hmm. Just don't do it. It's tempting. It's not going to teach them anything. They're going to eat on the cat. They're going to eat in an elevated space because that's what they ate in the wild. So no, punishment, unfortunately, does not work. Uh, it might backfire, stress the cat. Uh, it's just, it's one of those areas you think it might work, but that's where the video camera, if you would watch, <laughs> let's say you use it to stay off of the table and you roll the videotape, you're going to see that probably five minutes after you left the room, they were back up. So no punishment really, Chris has no no place in a multi kit They need feeding stations, separate stations, again, two feet away. They need their own food. They, they really, you know, I, I was guilty of this. I thought it was cute that I lined up my food bowls and I've, and I've, I've got slides on, on the internet to prove it. I thought it was cute that they would all eat together. When I, when I listen to one of the wonderful cat behaviors like uh, Sarah Larder, there's a number of them out there. Sorry, that shaking was from Lulu. One of our cats just jumped on the cat tree. Where my, where my, you have a little bit of an earthquake? Or or a, yeah, I think she was trying to make a point there. At any rate, you know, it's like you're new. She described like you're new at, at camp and you're all sitting together eating, you know, hot dogs or whatever, and you're, you're nervous, you're not happy eating that. You know, so cats want to eat off in the side by themselves without stress. So yeah, so that's a, a, a cat behavior, cat feeding mistake that I personally have made. So, but the cat behavior is a big, big part of this because if they're, and also a cat that doesn't have a, oh, an area that they feel is safe and away from the, they'll, they'll gorge their, they'll gorge their food. And then mm -hmm. guess what? They're going to be vomiting quickly after. They're not going to take that nibble, nibble, go back. And I actually have seen, it seems like the sure pet, I don't know if this has come up in the research uh, bar, but it seems like the people are happier that the feeder is taken over for that. And the cats know that the other cats can get into it after a while and they just stroll up and maybe that's why they eat so casually. So I think feeding behavior yeah. is is a part of that. And I'm not saying that everybody has to go out and invest in these products. You can do it taking a put cat in a different room and feeding it by itself. Obviously low tech. I have, you know, a number of different ways. So Barr, was there anything else on the studies that talked about feeding behaviors and what to do with the multiple cats? Um, not as of yet in terms of the analysis of the actual behaviors regarding to the feeding, uh, smart feeders. I'm still working on that. So I haven't gotten that far, but yes, overall high satisfaction. Like you said, they said a lot of the cat, they felt a lot, a lot of the cats were less stressed knowing that they were gonna get the food. They didn't have to, you know, especially in multi-cat households, there was no competition for the food. It was gonna be there. Um, so a lot more relaxed uh, cats in the household according to the pet parents, so. Absolutely, yeah. you know, I'm, and I'm just gonna, to, to mirror that, of course, the, the different locations, different locations, different locations, folks. It, it really helps, you know, whether it be food or, or litter boxes or anything, you know, that, that really helps cats um, kind of have, have that more relaxed and kind of confident time in whatever, whatever they're kind of focusing on from there. And, and Chris, I don't, I'm surely not the expert, but my, my colleagues on the AFP board, uh, they, they've, they've, there's a really good publication. It was just, I think it was out last spring. It was just before we did our study and it was very good time and maybe it was January, but it's about feeding behaviors and what we need to do and what we do. If it's open source, so if you can find a veterinarian who's an AFP member, they'll be able to access that document and print it out for you. But you'll find it fascinating, cat behavior. It's really cool. Oh, it, is, it is so nice. You know, it's, it's, I love how, how much we're really starting to dive into cats, um, cat behavior in, in a way and, and really publicize it that we haven't been in the past. You know, now, like kind of from some other questions as well, you, you kind of touched a little bit on it earlier, but, uh, you know, are y'all seeing any difference between a wet or a dry food when you're looking at uh, weight loss? We did our study strictly with dry, um, and we really had to limit the variables so that we could be sure, you know, that we, it was hard, candidly, it was very hard to find households to commit to the technology set up, to mm -hmm. you know, get veterinarians to supervise. This was a very, very well set up study, but it was candidly, we, Dr. Barr can speak to the numbers, but we, we couldn't, it was very hard to get, and we ended up with 20 cats, 10 traditional and 10 not so Barb, would you like to speak to that the details yeah of that? so and just for and for the study's sake we did we did keep to um 
using just a dry food, right, to limit our variables. And, and in general, I think for weight loss programs, you know, it doesn't really matter if you use dry or wet. It's kind of more, you know, uh, the nutritional makeup, caloric intake, uh, our caloric density, rather, of those things. You know, I guess the one um, uh, bright note with ours using um, those gram scales in the feeders, is, is since it's where we discussed this previously a little bit, uh, with the dry food, it's a little bit harder to get an exact measurement. So since we were able to use the gram scale, you know, able to get a little bit more precise with that. For the people that didn't have those, perhaps, you know, if you had a, if you had a can, you can kind of, it's easier to kind of measure a direct amount versus just getting those kibble. So in general, yeah. So in Chris, there are, there are some, I, I found that a, a little bit of canned, almost, most people will feed some canned. So again, for the study, we had to be stricter. But uh, the Sure Pet feeder can actually, you could put some portion of canned and a portion dry and see which is being eaten at what rate. So that study could be done. It just hasn't been. But there are people, especially older cats, cats with urinary problems, and mm. many people just in general. Um, Purina has just come out with a hydration product to encourage cats to drink more water. And we know that chronic dehydration is an issue. So I'm not saying dry cat food is perfect, but it, it is certainly in these automatic feeders to get the job done for weight management. I've not seen that it's harmful at all, but I know that we'll, you know, if you talk to 10 cat people, you'll find almost all of them are feeding some canned food. Um, I like to use bug as I told you was a challenge with me. Uh, what I do with her to slow her down because she'll steal everybody's food. And no, I do not have four <laughs> microchip feeders in my house, just one, <laughs> but I will take her canned food and take a portion out and mush it against the side and Liz Bales has made a little feeder like that where you mash it in where the cat has to work to get it out. Fantastic. Yeah. If somebody's got a cat that, that eats too fast and steals, you can slow them down with that real quick. So I think there's absolutely a, a use for canned food. But as far as strictly in research, you know, it's just, yes, that can be done. It just complicates the study. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, you've got that, uh, Jill is asking a little bit about that exercise wheel you have in the background. Um, you know, how, how, where does that lie on your kind of recommendation list? Have, have cats been using it? Do they enjoy it? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we have them, the kittens love it. Um, we do have a cat, cats that will do it. It takes, it's labor intensive. The laser works great. Um, we've had cats up here that literally, uh, that are fostering, we'll be downstairs doing surgery and we'll hear the cat start running on the wheel. It's like, <laughs> it's the coolest thing. I get all excited. My staff know I get, know I get excited easily, but I mean, that was just, but no, a lot of cats don't. It's a trick. There was a product that was going to come out of Korea that he embedded a laser, a little cat, the little cat, I think he called it a laser. Hmm. Dr. Hader and I got real excited about that. I wanted one for Bugs Gym, but I, I don't know if it made it to market. But it was brilliant because it had the laser T's in front. Now, we need to talk about with lasers, you, they need to kill something eventually. You can't just use a laser. And so, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. But even just holding a wand or your finger, you know, if anybody knows Samantha Martin, she's a fantastic cat trainer. She showed us that just using a stick and then rewarding, you can get cats to use the wheel. So she's been in our gym several times, uh, but we haven't taken the time personally to fully utilize the wheel. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, we've seen it all over and it's such a, an interesting thing to, to know how effective it really is. You know, one of the, the things we did talk a little bit earlier, you mentioned kind of the six to eight feedings a day. Kat was asking, you know, in, in her schedule, she feeds two times a day, roughly every 12 hours on there. You know, is is that okay for maintenance or weight loss or kind of where where do where do y'all lie on, on that two times a day feeding that every 12 hour feeding? Barb, do you want to talk? We did a little research for what we, with the study, we did three times a day. Mm -hmm. Three times a day, right. And now it's based on, on, on some research that was done that, that I recommended about what, four to six times a day was about the recommended um, amount of feedings. And so just practically speaking, it was just uh, easier to, to do, you know, three times a day. We understand that four, six, eight times a day is not, is not, unless you have a special feeder that's going to do it, right? I mean, who has, who has the time to do that? And so oh, we're all home now. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I guess now would be a good time, right? To try it out. So I don't know if anyone expect on that. There certainly are feeders that will do that, but they're not cat control. 
So you wouldn't, you couldn't be sure that the cat's getting the prescribed amount. But what has been interesting, I we were talking a little bit again before the show, we found that when you get down to the right amount of calories, which is lower than you would guess, we're watching on SurePet, they have a connect, you can actually see when the cat ate, how many calories it ate. And this is just five cats we've been watching here, but I have seen that they space their feedings out, even though my staff loads them twice a day. And by the way, I can tell when they load them. I'm at home, I get a ping on my phone, and it actually is a meow. They set it up on my tablet. So, so Ari, you can tell when the cats have been fed, and then they will eat in the middle of the night, even though the feeder has been filled twice a day. Isn't that crazy? And these cats are overweight cats that you would think would be ravenous. Well, it's either the food or knowing that the, their food is safe and secure that they can nibble again. And these feeding babies, this is where we're really fascinated, what we can add, give back to the profession of, of you know, what, what, what happens when you diet a cat? What, how, do, how do you do it right? And is the cat satisfied? So far, would, is there any other satisfaction? I mean, we want the client satisfied. We want to play by the cat rule book. But Barr, I don't think we've had hardly any negatives about the technology system. So far, no. And then I just to expand on that point, so we did do include, or we're hoping to um, get some results back from, we did a quality of life metric. Uh, it's, a, it's a health-related quality of life validated tool from um, University of Glasgow called Vetmetrica. So they kind of grade the, the um, based on a survey that the, that the pet parent does, what the quality of life is of their cats. And so we did that throughout our period as well. As, uh, along with activity and so I'm hoping to see how with weight loss and with uh, the caloric restriction how does that affect quality of life and so far we see that you know as one would expect quality of life does go up at least for one of their um, metrics um, as weight loss you know progresses so, so that's fantastic. And I, I don't have any metrics to back it up but I can tell you at least one of the five cats hunter we had to twice put him on uh, on CR because he was running around the gym and somehow injured himself. And he wasn't doing that when he was two pounds heavier. I, it's just amazing. The interaction, you know, six ounces after these cats get here for the first time, all of a sudden they're really attentive. They're hunting. Uh, there's a great study that was done, whether cats were, show, were, you know, showing, were able to show love and that sort of thing. But again, a validated study showed that, you know, they become more hungry and they're showing more attention to people. And so that's where I think the quality of life, I think that's why that index is, is going up. So it's, it's pretty cool because people worry about if I diet my cat, are they going to hate me? Oh, it's probably the other way around. Probably it is. You know, we, we, I think we as humans attribute more of that connection to food than, than cats do itself, kind of or those emotions to food um, as well. They, I think they more uh, attach uh, attention and just kind of what, they're, what they've learned, what they've you know, what we've taught them in some ways as opposed to an, an, an innate love on theirs. Now, you know, you mentioned earlier that that's that 50% protein line as well. Why is that 50% protein percentage in a food so important? Well, and I think you can draw the line a couple of places. Um, 40% 40, 40 is, is safe. Uh, mm -hmm. I, we're using Purina OM up in up on these cats and because it's 50% and then less than 300 calories. We need to get at least two grams per kilogram of ideal weight cat into them every day. And that's the trick. Um, so, and if that doesn't work, then we have to go slow enough so that again, we don't exceed that 1%. What we don't wanna lose is any muscle mass, especially in some of these older cats. So that's where the exercise comes in. They're helping to keep that up. But you know, we really, we wanna just get that 1% loss. We don't wanna do it too fast, but we, don't, we wanna burn fat, not muscle. Does that make sense? So it's really not about the ingredients or anything. It's food safety that this food has been used in, and again, we're talking the higher level cats, the eights out of nine and the nine out of nine. Seven out of nine, you could probably do a 10% reduction in calories, no matter what fruit. The problem is, Chris, the volume is so small. Mm -hmm. You can accurately, but the cat, I'm not sure the cat would be as happy. So we say filler is bad. And my joke to clients is, oh, what, what's the filler on a mouse? We got the ears, we got the tail, we got the right. So there is non-nutritive fiber in a mouse. Mm -hmm. Calories of a mouse, by the way, is 30. Six okay. mice a day, 
180 calories. That's pretty much, I think, where we, lizards, uh, and if you actually, uh, Zeb Zoran and uh, Tony Buffington did a great study on what is the protein of a lizard, a bird, and a mouse. And I think that was all about 56 to 58%. So that's the magic 50% that's very hard to get, very hard to get at a low calorie. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like I say, the filler, there is that, that, that change, you know, between a uh, volume of food can be very distressing to certain cats as well. You know, that's, that's the routine that they've worked themselves into. And, and, you know, managing that along with the weight loss is, is so key on there, you know, and, and of course, even one of these, uh, we also have a question that's about, you know, even begging, you know, just, you know, um, both of them will still, you know, both of these cats will still beg for food. Um, and, you know, is there any way that y'all, have y'all had that issue um, with any of your weight loss um, contestants or kind of, and if you did, how did you manage that? I guess my, my favorite comment on that is uh, hunger is a drive and begging is a behavior. So <laughs> there is no doubt that, and I tell my clients, yeah, I say, if they're not begging, you're probably still feeding too much. So mm -hmm. the thing is what we do when they beg, and certainly I'm not going to take the fun out of, uh, giving treats. So we should say that 10%, no more than 10% of a, of a dog or cat's calories per day should come from treats. And that means measuring, counting, using a nap, whatever you want to do. A lot of cat owners, I think we found a lot of cat owners don't do treats. Um, they, they're just fine with the food or you could use the food as a treat. I uh, tend to throw them across the floor and play cat hockey with my cats when I want them to burn a little bit. I mean, there's lots of ways you can use Doc Bales, uh, hide them in the feeder, hide them around the house. You, there's definitely a place for all these things. The key, I think, is just keeping track of all the calories that go in there and making sure that they're as high a protein as possible. Uh, Dr. Barr, do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think that I think that covers basically the main point. So, but it, it's a normal. I, I say, as the cat's a hunter. It's normal for them to, they're going to come to us. But again, I think we've seen with the feeders, sometimes they're not coming to us. They're coming to us for attention. So at that point, you pay, play with them, you pet them, rub their chin, whatever your cat like, but don't feed them. That would be my rule. Right. And, and I guess I add to that point, a lot of what we saw too is when they increase it to those three feeding times and, and you say begging behaviors, we did notice that when it starts to get around those times, a lot more activity, right? So you're getting a lot more active uh, more frequently throughout the day. So they'll come up, they'll jump, they'll meow, they'll run around, follow, you know, pet parents around. So you get a little bit of increased uh, um, activity just based on those increased feeding times and the caloric restriction com combination, right? So. That's interesting that you can see it reflected within the activity monitors as well. That's really, uh, that's fantastic data on there. Um, oh my goodness. I know we've got, we've got a few more questions, just a couple more minutes left on here. And so, uh, I'm pulling one out on here. You know, there is, we, we get kind of um, some of these questions all the time and and I know we mentioned it before and I, I knew it was gonna come up from there, but you know, the on the raw food standpoint, you know, uh, we're just, you know, we wanna hear y'all's response to, to the raw food because we hear it so much from clients as well. I'll, I'll give you the US version. I know we can see if the Canadian version is, it, is any different. Is that okay, Bar? You no, know, no. It comes up a lot in my practice. The, the problem is it might work, but there's no scientific evidence whatsoever. The AVMA, AHA, all of the organizations I'm familiar with do not, they're not, they're going to, they're going to discourage it um, because it's, it's not scientifically based. And I think particularly in, in weight management, I wouldn't want to put my cats at risk with that sort of thing, nor my clients. Um, it until it's proven, you know, if somebody wants to do that study, that's a, that would be a good study to do. But candidly, the Purina, Royal Canaan and Hills have all done exhaustive weight management uh, research over the years. They've done the protein levels. That's how we got to this point. So I, I would be, I would be very, uh, very adamant that people, and there's risk to immune suppressed people too. So I just have to follow the guidelines of my uh, very, very smart colleagues and, and trust that they know what's going on there. Well, um, and that's like I said, that's, that's the way that we have to do it. There's so much information out there always, always 
looking through those guidelines of, of the expert organizations. Uh, Dr. Barr, uh, how, how's the Canadian version? How's the Canadian version? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's the same, same thing here, right? So it's based on, uh, based on the science and until we can see some, some, some good evidence for it, uh, um, same, follow those recommendations that, that, uh, um, that the government gives here. And it's, and it's similar to AVMA, similar to US is, you know, recommends against in, in, most, in most situations, so. Yeah. All right. And then, you know, one of, one of kind of our, our last burning questions is where did the, where did the wall come from? Where did oh. that, that has come up? Well, a couple of times. We had to do something different. Actually, a Bugs Jim got published in a, a fantastic book. Uh, I don't think I have a copy. Bug might be sitting on it up there. She's just a big yawn. I wish I did. Anybody get that on the camera? Anyway, we got published in a book, Martha Klein's uh, uh, and Marianne Murphy fantastic book for veterinarians and for pet owners. We had a call out section on Bugs Gym uh, that was, you know, we're doing socialization, we're doing weight management. I thought, wow, you know, if it's going to get any more, any more publicity, I better dress it up a little bit. So we built the wall. And uh, so I was telling you earlier, I was, it was not a lot of cats climb it, but they do jump from perch to perch. The most fun we've had is the kittens. We filled this place with kittens and we're going to, let's see, we're coming up with the 2020 kitten Olympics. I hope we don't have to delay them, uh, but, but the 2020 kitten Olympics will be held again, but we've had kittens climb to the top of that and, and crazily with, and I call that the, the world's tallest scratching post, but they'll climb up that rascal and they just have, you know, so really it was, it was a inspired thing. Uh, some of the handholds had to come from Poland. If anybody wants to build one, I mean, they can get a little expensive, but it really is, uh, it's fun. People really like it and, and they really do use it. So. Well, you know, when, one last thing, question I always like to end on, and that's just to kind of give you all the floor a little bit as well as, you know, uh, we talked about a lot of different things today. Um, um, and we'll, of course, be posting all the links to um, to the contest, to, to Bob's webcam, um, any anything we can to get folks um, more aware about what you're doing or if they, they may want to participate or if you do have future studies in, in uh, rolling out as well. But is there anything that we did not cover today that you know, the, that you want to make sure that people go home with as well. Bar, what do you think? Anything? <laughs> yeah, no, and I think that, I think we cut, you know, the main, the main takeaways here for me would be, be, you know, how we can just big problem, right? How can we use, add to our toolbox? Can we use technologies as, as another tool? Um, mm -hmm. And that shift, like we're talking about from that, you know, episodic reactive medicine to continuous proactive. And then how can we, in, you know, empower owners to kind of take a more, uh, get more involved in the, in the, in the healthcare of their pets. And, and since they're the biggest advocates, of course, right, it's, it's, it's important for them to take that active role. And I don't think, I, I'm sure your audience understands the, the value of that, right? So, um, yeah, I think those would be the main highlights on my end. I guess the one thing I would add is uh, Dr. Hader and I have put a lot of time and effort into this and we really want to share it with veterinarians and but we want to share it with consumers as well. So we would always whatever tools we have again I what you said first off Chris work with your veterinarian. We're here to help those veterinarians. I think we've got the tools, we've got the foods, you know, the behaviors now we're working on it, right? But I really think that uh, if we all work together and share our knowledge and that's really what the, our new website is all about. It's Pets Reducing for Rescues. We're going to make a fitness challenge. We're going to keep this fun. There's no reason we can't get this done, uh, again, as a veterinarian. And I've seen it in my practice. I've seen those graphs. Every time, we, every time they come in, we, we see those graphs go down, and we tell, tell people what a great job. For these older arthritic cats, 90% of them are, arthri are arthritic. Can you imagine the amount of pain that's being added to because of the inflammatory nature. A cat, even 15% overweight is inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And what about inflammatory bowel disease? And what about all the other diseases? So prevention, I think, is everything. Uh, that's what I've done my whole career. And it's just an honor, actually, to partner with Dr. Hader and uh, Guelph and his fine team up, the team up there, and, and to have 
base pods, you guys are doing some of the most amazing genetic research. And I hope we can help maybe work together in the future, you know, maybe finding a link. We were talking off, offline about a, the ginger or orange cats being a little heavier. I've owned them my whole life. And they, <laughs> the challenge, well, so what, is there a genetic link there between the coat color? So I love, I love the stuff that you guys are doing. And I, and I look forward to working with you guys if we can work with you in the future. Oh well, if if is is the wrong word to use there. It's when when is the is the right. <laughs> word. You know, we we greatly greatly appreciate y'all both being on here. Y'all both do but y'all both do such great work towards obesity and um, understanding technology and how it changes the cat's world. And you know that technology is not only going to unlock for the consumer but also for the veterinarians. And from our standpoint, you know, the more consistent data that we have, the the better, the better understanding that we can have from a scenario. So about either obesity or, or weight loss or chronic kidney disease, anything like that. So we, we're so excited to see these types of, of activities roll out because your work will, will make our work better as well. So that's, that's why we, we are working together in the future. I'm, I'm using that word from there. And I'm sure that we will be seeing you pretty soon, Dr. Ken, as well. <laughs> Sounds good. And I'll uh, let me see if I can catch Bug. She's uh, everybody's got to get a close up of Bug because I know Anya will be very upset. She's playing up here on the surfboard. Say hi, Bug. <laughs> Say hi. <laughs> enjoying this, enjoying this by myself in elevated spaces, just like you can tell. So thank you all again both for your time. Um, it has been wonderful to have you all on. We'll be posting this to YouTube and all of the different comments for resources to get back to you all. So uh, have a great day. Um, and everyone out there, you all have a great day as well. And please stay safe, wash your hands, and join us again next week when we are going to start talking to Dr. Tina Wismer about um, from the ASBCA pet control hotline. Um, or poison control hotline to help understand how to make sure you keep your house safe for your cat as well. So, everyone, have a great day, and we'll see you all next week. <laughs>